perhaps Senator Rockefeller, you would um, introduce Senator Brown. I'd be very happy to do that. Um, but I have to first tear myself away from a picture that you do not have, which I do, which is the photograph of Senator, though that time he was 15 years old, Brown getting his Eagle Scout as an Eagle Scout person. It is, if you look at the photograph, you're so grateful that he was only 15 because if this photograph had ever gotten into one of his political campaigns, he'd be toast. <laughs> you're very Let's welcome. see it. <laughs> you're very welcome. Just a geeky look Pass it around. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sherrod, I think, is the, is the perfect senator. I mean, that's sort of a silly thing to say, but I think it's true. Uh, he, first of all, the voice. How can anybody not trust that man with that voice? <laughs> he, I hope he has a patent on that voice. But the thing is, it's backed up by all the um, humility and the knowledge and the brains and the energy of uh, an extraordinary human being. I think sort of, sort of my most favorite senator at the time. The, the, um, he, did, he started out everything right. His father was a, a doctor who went door to door and gave health care whether people could pay for it or not. Didn't matter to him. His mother wasn't a doctor, but she was an incredibly tough mom and just believed in preaching what's right and what's wrong. So that's built into the DNA. You know, the service and the, the righteousness is built into him, as, the, as well as the Evangelical Lutheran Church, which I didn't know about. Yeah, I'm impressed by that, very impressed by that. But then the guy really works and uh, he's on all of his committees, if you look at them, they're all the committees that are the most help to his constituency. Agriculture, nobody done agriculture for what, 100 years or something like that? <laughs> no, but been on the committee, yeah. And Veterans Committee, um, the, the whole, you know, the whole business of, of banking and finance, and all of their legislation. He, uh, he, he just sort of took up very recently, or a couple of years ago actually, the, the uh, Children's Health Insurance Program, which was always in need of reauthorizing in which everybody wants, you know, up, up at the other side of the field, wants to eliminate along with large portions of uh, Medicaid and Medicare. I was a governor for eight years, and it, it's unbelievable the pressure that comes to not doing Medicaid. Um, people. When Medicaid was first announced, Sheridan, I think this is true, by um, LBJ, um, I don't think it was reported. I mean, Medicare was reported, Social Security was reported. I don't think Medicare, Medicaid was reported, Judy. And I'm told that the New York Times, in writing up the uh, you know huge announcement, just left out Medicaid altogether because of a very small program. You know, I always wondered whether the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which goes by the acronym CMS, yeah. which M were they expecting to drop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got named that in 2002. Don't be oh, paranoid. <laughs> 2002. I'd say do be. Yeah, or do be paranoid. Thank you. Right. Yeah. But um, he, you know, he, he takes on trade issues. Um, NAFTA, back in 1993 when he was in the House, I think, um, he sort of led that fight. N NAFTA, I, I'm actually more of a, a little more of a free trader than Sherrod, which may color what he says about me, but it's true. Uh, but NAFTA was the greatest disaster in the history of trade agreements. And I just watched in West Virginia, in, in our 55 rural counties, as just one factory producing sneakers or, or shoes or, you know, uh, garments or whatever, just closed one after another. After two years, they were all closed. And those were all the main plants in our rural counties. But, you know, he's, he understands that. Um, and boy, is he tough on protecting uh, Medicare. Uh, I mean, he's fought against the, the uh, privatization, uh, fought on, and, you know, but just to say that is very easy, but then there are people who really do it and people who talk about it, and he really does it. It's his nature. Um, I just, uh, I'm very honored to, to know the guy. And um, another thing I liked about him, which isn't immediately due to health care, but it was a part of the shaping of the, of the guy, of the man. And that is, he went at a certain time in the early 90s over to Poland for two years uh, to teach. They were just getting away from communism and Lech Walesa was in power, and he was teaching democracy and government 
for two years in Poland. First of all, I didn't know that until I was preparing for this speech. And secondly, I value that enormously because all of those are grounding experiences which, which, which gives you vision like this. And it's, it's like doing the Peace Corps. You know, you, if you don't go overseas, if you don't go out of your box at some point dr dramatically from the way you've grown up, I don't think you're, you're as sensitive to people or to ideas as Sherrod Brown is. So that I am I'm really, really honored. I mean, he's a giant in healthcare. I, I, I love the fact he's on the Finance Committee. And um, I present him to you. Jay, thank you. I've been introduced lots of places by lots of people, and this one may have been the most meaningful just because of my respect, first from a distance. Before I was in the Senate, I knew Jay from a, a little bit back in the 80s when my brother worked with him in, in West Virginia. But um, the more I got to know him, the better I liked him and the more I respected him. And I treasure so much the breakfast or lunch when, especially when a Rockefeller was paying for it, but <laughs> the breakfast or lunch we used to have in his office. And thank you. My voice is like this anyway, remember? Um, That's why you just said Yeah, the breakfast and lunch we used to have. And I just, I so valued his counsel and his mentoring. And he made me so much better at this job. And he both encouraged me and encouraged Harry, encouraged me to want to be on the Finance Committee and encouraged Harry Reid and discouraged somebody else who wanted to keep me off, without mentioning names that Tamara and Jay both know, um, from getting on the Finance Committee. And that, that so I thank you for that and so many other things. Uh, Jay, Jay mentioned my Lutheran upbringing. I want to tell one, I, I spoke yesterday at a breakfast uh, at the Capitol for the Lutheran, um, it's a Lutheran refugee settlement organization. And I thanked them for their advocacy. And I recited a bit, bit of Matthew 25, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. What you do to the least of these, wait. And I said, you know, uh, at some point in my life, I realized that Jesus never would have said the least of these. He didn't think the people that serve us lunch are less than senators or that, that Judith is less than Diane. He obviously wouldn't have said that, but that's how a bunch of guys that made this translation over the last 2,000 years said he did. But a friend of mine who is a UCC pastor turned me on to a Bible called the Faith and Justice Bible. And I had it on my desk. I looked at it from time to time. And I decided to look up Matthew 25 and what Matthew, what, what this translator said, Jesus said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was naked, you clothed me. What you did to those who seem less important, you did for me. And I just love that, and I will never again say the least of these, because I used to say it too, because progressives, progressives do say things like helping others and what you do to the least of these, and so, I say it differently now, but um, because of that experience. But thanks for reminding me. Now, then, uh, Jay made fun of my voice, as so many do. And I was at a. Um, and I don't smoke. I'm not sick. I just talk this way. And I was at a. I was at a um, event one time. And uh, Jay was at. Jay was not at that. It was a Democratic convention. And Jay was. I remember having breakfast with him one day there. But this was not at that. At the same time. But we were in a room about this size, with a little, with a little pl pl platform like this. And. No tables and chairs, and everybody squeezed in like this, tightly packed in. And, and my wife was there and standing next to a guy, a true story she'd never seen before. And as I start to speak, this guy turns to Connie and says, God, I hate that guy's voice. <laughs> she said, really? And he said, yeah, when he speaks, it's like fingernails on a blackboard. And, I, and Connie says, really? I like his voice. And she said, he said, you like that guy's voice? She said, yeah, I really like it. She goes like this and leans in. She said, I really like it when he wakes me up in the middle of the night and says, I love you, baby. <laughs> so... True story. Um, and not, not, not only do I so admire Jay and respect him and, and in some sense devote my career to so much, so much that he did and fought to enhance and expand and protect because we're always playing offense and playing defense to do these jobs right. Um, Tamara has also been, I, she started with Jay. I got to know Tamara when she um, ran the office across the hall from me in my first year in the Senate. Uh, the, the then junior, I guess she was junior senator. She was always junior senator from New York, right? Hillary was, yeah. yeah Share state with Chuck Schumer. Yeah, so just, yeah. yeah. Well, she's junior or not, she shared a good point. Um, <laughs> but she was as 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 Hillary did, but especially Tamara gave such counsel and such mentorship 
and such wisdom to our office. To me, to uh, the, the mayor of New York, upstate New York, to our office, just one kind of, she understood these offices so well, she could counsel us sort of on every level of the office, from casework to legislation to media to administration to all of that. And she was, you know, she started as chief with Jay and um, he taught her so much and they both have taught me so much and I, I, am, I am so grateful to that. So, um, Last so other point I want to make is Jay talked about being being son of a, of a doctor who made house calls and all that. Walking in here today, there was a little um, dish of Hershey Kisses. And my dad would, for his patients, if for the children he had to give shots to, he would give them a Hershey Kiss. But my dad never gave me a Hershey Kiss. <laughs> so I got one today. So thank you for that. He would also bring home, I know it's, he, he in those days, they didn't have the disposable needles. He'd bring home these needles from the office that really weren't very sharp. And he'd give us flu shots, and he'd boil the needles. He'd boil the water. I mean, he'd do it right. He'd boil it on the stove, but then he'd, like, jam us with these shots. This, it wasn't really very sharp. I got over it over time. But <laughs> anyway, stop enough of that. So um, Jay left the Senate in January and December 2014, as you know. And he asked me... Uh, Chip was up for reauthorization. We know his efforts in, in creating it and making it happen and shepherding it through and protecting it. Even though a number of people say that they played a role, they weren't always on board when, but eventually they were, and Jay played such a role in creating it. Uh, when he left, he asked me to take up the mantle on Chip uh, and leading that fight. We know our work's never done. It's never done, I, even though uh, Secretary Price committed eight years in, a, in the hearing to me, committed eight-year reauthorization. Uh, the the eight years he talked about isn't quite the re, isn't the reauthorization of quite the same bill that we updated in 2010. But so that the fight the fight is always there. Um, special thanks to Judy Montalnado from the community I lived in for 10 years in Lorain, Ohio. I appreciate all as all of you did her words and thanks especially to SEIU um, in their fight for 15. And that suggests too. I want to thank the people who served us today. Um, progressives always thank hourly wage earners who never make as much as they earn, as much as they should should make. So special if any of them are in the room, thank you um, for serving us. <laughs> Last week was an especially big, I don't wanna I don't wanna gloat, I don't wanna say it was a win in the sense that you know, we expanded health insurance, but last Friday was a, was a big deal for our country, as you know. Um, it, the bill essentially was a big tax cut um, paid for by cuts in Medicaid. I mean, fundamentally, that the bookends of what that bill did was. Um, that being said, it wasn't, don't, don't, don't believe for a minute it was the House Freedom Caucus or Paul Ryan or someone else who stopped this bill's terrible, this terrible bill's repeal. Um, understand it was you. It was activists all over the country. It was people that stood up and, and told their stories, especially telling their stories of, of what, of a 25-year-old uh, in, in Huntington, West Virginia, who's, who's on her parents' health plan, who's getting opioid treatment, or uh, it's a young family with a child with a pre-existing condition in Chillicothe, Ohio, who got health insurance after trying and trying and trying um, because, of the pre because of this legislation or the literally 100,000 Ohio seniors who save $1,100 on their prescription drug, the million Ohio seniors, literally a million, who have gotten um, who, who, who have gotten preventive services, uh, osteoporosis screening, diabetes screening, other preventive services for free, no copay, no deductible, because of the expansion of Medicare benefits. And don't, I mean, don't ever forget that was all part of it too, but it was those, it was people telling stories um, that got us there. And it was, it, was what, it was what happened in the general public pushing back on this new 2017 agenda coming from the White House and the Congress. Um, I, uh, you, you remember, of course, the Women's March, I assume. How many of you were at one of the Women's Marches? Of course you were. Um, thank you. Thanks for wherever you were in the Women's March. You also remember six days later, um, there was a, or seven days later, the president did his first cruel, inhumane executive order on immigration. And some of you did what my wife and I did and went to an airport and, and, and rallied in opposition to this attack on lots of Americans and this injection of fear from the White House into so many families in this country, immigrant families, families of color, families that have 
where, where they might not have been brought up in the Lutheran church, the kinds of things they did. And my, I have a real quick story. My daughter took her almost three-year-old daughter, our granddaughter, to her first political rally. And she showed up. It was a cold day, 1,000 people, Columbus Airport, January 28th or whatever it was. And she came with her first homemade protest sign. And if you had seen little Jackie's protest sign, you would have thought it was just a scribble on a piece of cardboard like this. But if you had my grandfatherly x-ray vision, you could, see, you could see what this sign actually said was rage against the fascist machine. Oh, and she was, she was learning at a very young age what all of this meant. So, um, you know, we, we, I, I'm still concerned. I mean, what happened last Friday was great for the country, no question. Um, I'm still concerned about what's next. I'm concerned, first of all, that they might try to come back and do it again. I don't quite know how that works, how they can do it. There's no way when you've got my governor and my state, a Republican, saying don't do this unless you can find a way to ensure those 700,000 Medicaid beneficiaries in Ohio, 200,000 of whom are getting opioid treatment, 200,000 under insurance, 200,000 in just my state. And another 100,000 are on the Affordable Care Act for their, because of their parents, and another 100,000 on the Affordable Care Act because of the exchanges. I don't know how you unravel that and possibly find another way to insure them next, uh, short of what we ought to do, Medicare for all. But um, you know, I don't, I don't know where you go with that. But I, but I do know that we, we know the attacks on Medicaid are coming. We know that. You know, they don't call it, um, it's one of those things, they don't call it um, Medicaid block grants anymore because they know that's been discredited, again, because of a lot of you in this room and Jay and others and Tamara and, and Judith and others that have, have fought against Medicaid block granting because we know what it means in the end. It's a way to squeeze poor people so you can pay for more tax, more Paul Ryan tax cuts. But we also know that they've come up with a different name. It's per capita Medicaid now. and to give the states flexibility and all the, the happy talk they do around it, but we are ready for it, and we know we will push back on that as the public will, as hospitals, think of all the rural hospitals in Jay's home state that, will, that could go out of business with Medicaid cuts. We know that. We know that the Cleveland Clinic or UH in Cleveland or OSU Hospital in Columbus could stand it, could deal with it. It hurt, but it would mean scaling back of care, but they won't go out of business. Rural hospitals could, you all know that. And that's, that's the, the other reason this is so important. So um, we need to continue to be vigilant. We need to continue to, to advocate, to play offense and defense. Emer Emerson said that the history is a battle between the innovators and the conservators. The conservators just want to hold on to their wealth and privilege and tax cuts and, and don't change, and innovators want to move the country forward. We've had eras we moved the country forward dramatically, as Jay was talking about Medicaid in 65. We had incredible victories in those days. Then we played defense for a while and preserved what we had with intermittent kinds of moving forward. Then in 2009 and 10, we moved forward with Jay's leadership on health care and with uh, Dodd-Frank and all that, and then we play defense. But it's always that tension and always why your activism matters. And I'll, I'll close with a story from a, probably the other person in the House and Senate I most admire, and that is Congressman Lewis from Georgia. And you know John's history. You know John was beaten up more than anybody in the Civil Rights Movement. You know John was at the first crossing of the um, Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, back in 2015, on the 50th anniversary, uh, Senator Scott, an African-American Republican senator, very conservative from South Carolina, and I, he and I led a delegation with John to the uh, 50th anniversary, a delegation about 100 members of the House and Senate to the 50th anniversary of the bridge crossing, uh, or the bridge beating. And John, um, John tells a story. I was writing John on the plane, and he had just spoken a year before, this was March of 15, a year before, he had been the graduation speaker, imagine this, at Ole Miss. That John Lewis spoke at Ole Miss, tells you that the times, maybe they are changing. And John, John, John told this story. John, John was born in 1940, so figure out the era. In the mid-50s, he um, went off to Fisk, I believe, in Tennessee. And John, John, John was telling the story. He, he said when, when he was a kid in, outside of Troy, Alabama, grew up on a chicken farm. And his parents took him into Troy one time, and John was 14, 15 years old. And he, after they walk out, he says, well, mom, 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 dad, what did this mean? It said, it said colored only restroom, white only restroom, colored only waiting room, what, what does that mean? And his parents said, John, 
don't ask tr- don't ask questions, don't make trouble. And he said that wasn't good enough. So he went to his grandparents, like Grandma, Grandpa, what what did that mean? White only, colored only. White. What what did that mean? And his grandparents said, John, don't ask questions, don't make trouble. And John said, then at the age of 17, I met Rosa Parks. And then at the age of 18, I met Martin Luther King. And I told them those stories, and they said, no, John. They both said, John, no. Ask questions, make trouble, make good, necessary trouble. And that's what a lot of you do here. You make good, necessary trouble. You make sure that members of Congress hear these stories, see your activism, see the people whom you fight for, the people whom you represent. And that's why this country continues with falling back sometimes and stumbling sometimes why this country keeps moving forward. So um, thank you for your service, Jay. It's such an honor to deliver the Jay Rockefeller Lecture, and thank you so much.